Hi there, let's explore the fascinating world of periodic table focusing on how elements are classified into different groups. Let's set aside hydrogen for a moment and look at the rest of the table. So based on certain groups clubbed together, we have these two groups, group 1 and 2, making S block. What you see on right from group 13 to group 18 is P block. What you see in the center from group 3 to group 12 is D block. And here a part of, you know, the group 3 is set aside and this is what we call as F block. Let's talk about each of them one by one. Let's begin with the S block. So yes, the first up is S block. The S block elements are those where the last electron enters the S orbital of the nth shell. Okay, so if it is 2S, this is lithium, so 2S1. Sodium, 3S1, potassium, 4S1, rubidium, 5S1 and so on forth, right? Similarly, beryllium is 2S2. Magnesium is 3s2, calcium is 4s2 and so on forth. The general electronic configuration is inert gas ns1 or 2 like we saw for group 1 it is ns1 and for group 2 it is ns2. All of these are metals because they love to lose electron and become positive ions or what we can call as cations. Okay. Now moving to the p block. So in P block, you would see that the last electron enters the P orbital of the nth shell. Okay, so the block contains a fascinating variety of metals, non-metals and metalloids. If you see the entire periodic table and whatever non-metals you see, they are going to be in P block. In fact, all the metalloids, so if you see this zigzag line, boron, silicon, germanium, arsenic, antimony, tellurium, polonium, all of these you can see is making a zigzag line. They are metalloids, okay? The properties of metalloids are transitioning from metals to non-metals. So the elements like fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, all of these are non-metals. So I can henceforth say that this block includes some metals, all non-metals and metalloids. Okay, an interesting fact is S and P block together are called representative or main group elements. So S block and P block together is seen as main group elements. Now comes the D block. So in D block, you will see that the last electron enters N minus 1D subshell and electronic configuration can be written like this. N minus 1D 1 to 10, NS 0 to 2. For example, if we take chromium, the electronic configuration is 3D5-4S1 and that of manganese is what? 3D5-4S2. You remember the electronic configuration of these two elements? Now, these D block elements are called transition elements because you would see that the properties transition from going from left to right. On left, we have very reactive metals. On right, we have highly reactive non-metals and the properties transition in going from left to right. So these are called transition elements. And in the same manner, we have four series, four transition series. If the valence electron is going to 3D subshell, then we are calling it a first transition series. If it is going to 4D subshell, we are going to call it second transition series. If it is going to 5D subshell, we are going to call it third transition series. If the valence electron is entering the 6D subshell, we're going to call it fourth transition series. Okay, now let's talk about the properties of D block elements. One of the most important characteristics of D block elements is they show variable oxidation states. This means the same element can lose different number of electrons in different compounds, leading to the formation of ions with different charges, right? For example, iron 2 plus, iron 3 plus, both exist, right? Now, you would also see that most of these elements that you see in D-block acts as a catalyst. What are catalysts? Substances that speed up a chemical reaction without being consumed in the process. For example, iron is used as a catalyst in Haber's process to make ammonia, okay? So, iron is again one very crucial catalyst. Nickel is another one that you will study in organic chemistry in catalytic hydrogenation. So, there are many elements like platinum, palladium that you will hear a lot in organic chemistry being used as catalysts. So all of these are D-block elements if you observe. 
Another fascinating property of d-block elements is that many of their ions are colored. That's right. Now, it is due to, again, the electronic transition between the d orbitals when they absorb visible light. Uh, we'll study more about them when we talk about the coordination chemistry. Okay. So, that's why you would see that the compounds of copper, chromium, manganese, the compounds of most of these are colored. For example, this hydrated copper sulfate that I'm talking about is blue in color. The compounds of manganese are green in color and that of chromium is purple in color. Now, most of the d-block elements are paramagnetic, which means they're attracted to a magnetic field. This happens because they have, again, see all the explanations are interlinked if you see. So, they are paramagnetic because you would see that the electronic configuration is such. For example, if we talk about manganese, it is 3d5, 4s2. If I remove two electron, make it manganese 2 plus, we have 3d5. You see, we have so many unpaired electrons. So, actually what happens is the presence of these unpaired electrons creates a small magnetic moment, making the substance magnetic, okay? And most important thing, you will not find a single non-metal in the entire D-block. All of these are metals. That's right. But there is a very interesting, crucial point that these elements that you see in group 12, right? Zinc, cadmium, mercury, these are not considered to be transition elements. They are in fact called pseudo-transition elements or not true transition elements because they do not have partially filled d orbitals in neutral state or in any of their stable oxidation state. So actually in this whole group 12, the electronic configuration is N-1D10NS2. Even if you take the plus 2 oxidation state of all of these elements like Zn2+, then you would see the electronic configuration is N-1D10. So it doesn't have unpaired electrons in the D subshell. So, all these properties that we had been talking about like uh, paramagnetic behavior because of the unpaired electrons and the color because of unpaired electrons, all of these variable oxidation state, all of these are not possible. So, you can see that all of these elements cannot show most of the properties that we discussed. So, they are not considered transition elements. The reason is simple. In its stable oxidation state as well as in neutral state, it doesn't have any partially filled d orbital. Okay, now let's move on to this block which is F block. Now, why are we doing partiality with this F block? Why is it so separately placed? We don't want unnecessary expansion of the periodic table. Henceforth, to avoid this undue expansion of the periodic table, we keep this F block a little separately like this. Okay, now within each series, the properties of the elements are quite similar. So, like all other blocks, F block is characterized by filling of the F orbitals of anti penultimate shell. What are we referring to? What is this anti penultimate shell? Let's just understand what is penultimate shell first, okay? So, penultimate shell is nothing but this N minus 1D subshell that we have seen, right? So, because this is not the outermost shell, N will be the highest shell number, right? This is N minus 1. So, this is penultimate shell. Anti-penultimate means N minus 2 and N minus 2 F subshell because we are talking about F block here. F orbital of anti-penultimate shell, that means N minus 2 F. So, outer electronic configuration would look like this. N minus 2, F 1 to 14, at least one electron has to be there. Then N minus 1, D 0 to 1, N S 2. This is the electronic configuration for F block, the general electronic configuration. Now here also like you can see, we can see two colors here, right? The first one can be called as a lanthanide series and this is first inner transition series because the last electron is added to the 4F orbital. And uh, if in case it's entering 5F orbital, then that is second inner transition series, also called actinoids. So let's talk more about the F block. Here, all these elements that you see in F block belongs to third group. That's easy to crack. Next one is all of these are also called rare earth metals. See, talking about lanthanide series, 
it ranges from cerium to lutetium and they are known for their uniform plus 3 oxidation state though if you can show plus 2 or plus 4 also okay a key feature is lanthanoid contraction we'll talk more about it in depth going ahead but yeah i mean the size nearly is similar for all of these elements for now you can only guess the reason okay most of the lanthanoids are very soft silvery white metals and they are paramagnetic and form colored ions whereas if we talk about actinoids it's from thorium to laurentium all of these are radioactive with many exhibiting variable oxidation states especially in early part of their series okay and let me also tell you these elements that you see at the bottom they don't just sit so quietly on the periodic table but they often come with a radiation warning label uranium that you see and plutonium this atomic number 92 and 94 for instance power the nuclear reactors most of the actinoids are paramagnetic and have very complex electronic configurations so i'm not entering into the configuration right now elements beyond uranium we call these elements as transuranium elements and they are synthetic that's right they're man-made and they're so reactive that it's very difficult to study them so the research on them is still ongoing